Merry Christmas, everyone. Wow, what a time of year. This is the time that whether the world wants to acknowledge it or not, everybody's celebrating Christmas. And we're thrilled about that. And we're thrilled that you're with us this morning here at Bridgeway Baptist Church in Havelock North, New Zealand. My name is Dalton Walker, and I'd like to ask you, if you have your Bibles, to turn over this morning to Luke chapter 2, and if you'll let me, I'm going to read the Christmas story to you. We're posting just a little bit late, and that's because our church had it in the park and didn't have our recording gear, but here it is for you this morning, that same message with the same truths. Join with me, if you would, please. Luke chapter 2, verse 8 through 20. A few verses this morning, right? Appropriate? And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over the flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Can you just place yourself in the setting for a second? There was no technology. There was no TV. There was no internet. There was no light pollution in this field where these shepherds were at. And all of a sudden, like it's a 4th of July or Guy Fox Day, as we call it here in New Zealand, all of a sudden it's almost as if, well, I think the closest that you could relate, it's like fireworks going off, a mega fireworks show in the sky and one single angel coming unto them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. Wasn't just some light. Can you imagine these shepherds, these lowly people. And I, I just find what a blessing it is to see that he didn't go to the kings. He went to just regular folks like you and me. And the glory of the Lord shone around about them. And he said, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people someday in glory. Someday I'm going to want to see that in instant replay, in color, high definition, I'm going to want to see that. And he said, for unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior, which is Christ the Lord. Wow. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Now you think about this, what these shepherds had already seen with this one angel, and now there's a multitude of, unto them, and these lowly shepherds, shepherds are saying, why are these appearing to us? And they said, here's how you'll see it. It's a sign. You'll find the babe, this Christ, the Lord, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, a lowly birth, speaking to, can I say it, lowly people. And he would live a lowly life here on the face of the earth. Wow. Think about that for a moment. Because I really don't think that we think about Christmas the right way. And those swaddling clothes were prophetic because those are what they wrap the clothes in of people that they would bury. And the Bible says, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into, he into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us go now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord had made known to us. Now, just a big point right here. When you study culture 
I want you to know that these shepherds, their testimony, their reputation was built upon them taking care of these sheep. Flat out, that was their reputation. The Bible said that they basically dropped everything and said, let's go right now to see this. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Can you imagine? They didn't go to the hotel, the motel, whatever it was. They didn't go to that unit. They went out here to the barn looking for Jesus. I'm just trying to put it in perspective for you this morning. And when they'd seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at these things which were told them by the shepherds. We always think that it is the elite that do the work of God, but it's just the lowly. It's the lowly, it's the regular person that does the work of the Lord. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. What do you mean, these things? Well, don't you know the shepherds said, hey, we were alone. It was a dark night. It was probably a clear night or whatever. And this angel burst on the scene and it was like the sun of day. And then multitudes came and they told us all these sayings. And then we came and found you. And sure enough, here you are in a barn with the baby lying in a manger, that device which they would put the hay or the feed that the animals would slobber on and eat out of. And the Bible says Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. What a beautiful story this morning. And there's so many different areas that we can look at. But I think today I want to show you with clarity the reality of what was given. Heavenly Father, thank you for this very special time of year. And Lord, this message, Lord, that you've laid upon my heart that people need to hear this morning. Be with us in Jesus' name, amen. I love the Christmas season. I love everything about it. And I think I'm still like a little kid. I get caught up in it. And there's just like no other time like it throughout the year. But it really depends upon how you look at Christmas. Statistically, did you realize here in New Zealand, and I'm sure many other places, it's one of the most depressing times of year? That's right. Matter of fact, here in New Zealand, it's been defined as the most violent, domestically, the most violent time of year. And I, I can't help but think that that's not the, really what God had intended for people when he said, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. I don't think that's the rejoicing God had in mind. You say, how do you reconcile that, Brother Walker? I think that really what's going on is we've missed the boat. We don't really see what Christmas was all about. We, we take off Easter, we take off Christmas and ask any of those people, how many of them they really took that off for the Lord? And you see, if we're not careful, Christmas comes about what we got or what we gave. And it's no longer about the Lord. Because when it comes to the Lord, you don't need anything else. And that's what God was teaching them. He was the one. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. Jesus, in defining who he was, said that he had come to seek and to save that which was lost. He must be about his father's business from an early age. He came to give. He came to obey the Lord. How can you go wrong when you're living a life like that? And so if God knows everything, didn't he know that? And couldn't he have prevented it by giving us everything that would make us happy? Because people start months out, what do I want for Christmas? What do I want? You know, if you go back in Christmas and you'll study it, it was all about Jesus. And then it became about, well, it was that one time of year that people gave themselves things or gave other people things. Matter of fact, you were lucky at Christmas. 
if you'd get uh, just history here, a goose for Christmas. That's right, a goose. And whether it's a goose, a turkey, a chicken, a ham, whatever it is, you're just happy if you could share a meal. And then slowly over time with the commercialism that's out there today, it drug us back into the deal where it was all about us. One of the ways we tried to prevent that in raising our children when they were growing up is throughout the week, each day they'd get to open a present. Okay, so each day, a week before Christmas, they got to starting with the smallest thing and then graduating to the day before Christmas, we would gift them things, let them open up things. And that's a parent's joy to see those things. I get that. I, I want you to understand that I don't think there's anything wrong with giving gifts at Christmas time. But I'll tell you what we did to keep it in perspective for our boys. We created a culture just after we'd been married, and that was this. 45 years now, Mrs. Walker and I have been married. And we would look at it and we went, okay, but Christmas Day, when everybody else is opening their gifts, and our kids, they can't feel bad because they've been opening them all week long and teasing the kids at school. But on Christmas Day, we said this is the Lord's birthday today. And that's how we tried to counter that with our kids. And a lot of times we would go and do things for other people during the week too, less fortunate, so that our kids would realize just how good they really had it and how bad others had it. So Christmas, right? Oh, we get excited. Mama takes everything. My wife, she'll take all the pictures. She wraps them up and uh, ties a bow around them. And she goes through the house and she's just kind of humming and singing along. And we just sit back and watch her and ask her if she needs any help. No, 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 I got this. And man, I'm telling you, Christmas trees go up. Things go up everywhere. Because my wife loves that Christmas time. If I were to ask you, how many of you people got what you wanted on Christmas Day? And you'd lift your hand this morning. You got what you wanted. How many people would lift their hand and say, I wanted more? Real quick, how many of you can think of something you wanted that you didn't get this Christmas? Maybe it's a new car, some gadget, uh, a holiday or vacation, furniture, jewelry, etc. Something along those lines. Something, let's be real, material. And how many of us are, are really rejoicing for what heaven did for us this Christmas? Let me back up. I want to say that again. How many of us are really rejoicing for what heaven did for us this Christmas? How many of us are taking that day and preparing for it and preparing our children for it or family members for it and, and, and just looking at it and saying, you know, this Christmas, we're going to do it right. We're going to pre we're going to prepare our hearts for that day. and We're going to talk about what Christ did for us. You say, no, 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 we already did that at Thanksgiving. But that was just a holiday. We're talking about the celebration of Jesus Christ. I mean, there was no logical reason the wise men brought gifts to Jesus. They weren't related to him. They weren't neighbors. They weren't friends. They weren't family. But there was a spiritual reason to bring those gifts to Jesus. I've been asking our people here in Havelock North, I've been asking them for about a month, is there any more room for Jesus at Christmas in your life? How many believe is that, that, that Jesus really is the reason and it shows in our lives? And so having said that, let me add this to it. Is there any more room for miracles in your life? Is there any more room for a real miracle? Now, let me explain a real miracle. Some people blow through all the stop signs or stop lights, and they say it was a miracle. And inside, if I can be real with you, I kind of boil. I, I kind of get hot under the collar because I go, quit diluting or diluting 
what miracles are. Miracles have to defy the laws of science. That's a miracle. Jesus was a miracle. A virgin birth. The Bible said that God created a new way here on the earth. And that way was a virgin birth of Jesus Christ. All right? And so the wise men were probably from Persia. They knew the Hebrew scriptures, going all the way back to Daniel. And they found it easier to believe the prophecies of the Old Testament that Jesus was the Messiah than the Jews actually did. So they brought him gold, which was always a valuable gift. It was a monetary gift, but it was a gift worthy of a king. And they brought frankincense, and a lot of people really don't know about these particular gifts. It would take that, that gold to later on move them around and take care of them in the early parts of Jesus' life to protect him, okay? And the frankincense, did you know it, it still today is a universal cure? Frankincense is, we have some here at our house and there are times we use frankincense and it's really sought after for its healing properties. And, and then the myrrh, the myrrh was used in the Old Testament tabernacle and different places to purify a home and it really, if I could go into the science of it, accesses the hippocampus and, and it goes into that place where our emotions are and helps prepare us. That's why they would burn incense in the Old Testament tabernacle. That's right. Look in the Bible. They would do that because it helped clear their mind, prepare them for worship. And what it is, is they took and gave their very best to Jesus. And the lesson is we need to give our very best to Jesus because he's the best gift God could ever have given to us. And we sit down and we say, okay, I want you to take out a pencil and piece of paper, and I want you to ask yourself, you know, what could God have given me? Some people that might be a car, and, and for some people that might be health, and for some people that might have been a number of children, or to not have lost a child, or to, instead of having boys, to have had girls, or vice versa, or Change situations in your life. God said the number one thing they need is my son, Jesus Christ. You know why? Because that's an eternal gift that keeps on giving. That's right. When God sent his son to us, he was giving us what we needed the most. So first of all, this morning, because Jesus is what we needed the most. That's right. If we're going to see Christmas for the way that it is, we need to realize that when God gave his son, he did so because he knew what we needed the most. More than anything else, we need Jesus. And because Jesus is what we need. I mean, think it through real quick this morning, if you would, please. What do you believe that you need the most? And would Jesus be the top of that list? Is it money? There's a story of of uh, Peter and John, if you'll remember in Acts chapter three and that first eight verses. Now, Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour and a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that's called beautiful to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asking alms, all right? So here's a person, forgive me, if this sounds crude to you, but a person that's lame or crippled from birth, he was that way. What do you think that he thought that that day would be like for him? Do you think that he thought this is a bad day to beg? This is a bad day to look for, for uh, pity and help from people? The Bible said, who's seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple asking alms, that is, would you give, please? And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, 
walking, leaping, and praising God. You think he thought he was going to get that on that day? Can you imagine what he thought it was going to be like when money's tight? It's easy to think that all of our problems could be solved with money. Earlier, I told you that, you know, that one of the reasons uh, that people look at it different, it's evidence that here in New Zealand, it's the most violent time of the year. How did it get that way? It got that way because, number one, people don't have the tools they haven't learned from God's word to spend time together. I'm just going to say it. And secondly, because people get depressed, discouraged, angry because they can't give other people what they wanted to or someone else gave them something they wish they could or they didn't get what they wanted along those lines. I've interviewed enough of them. That's because they've lost their way. If that was true, then all the rich and famous people would be happy and content. Every day in the newspapers, we hear about another person who's been blessed. They're wealthy. They're well off. And can I say you can get a disease overnight that would drain every finance. You can get into a situation where you lose all your finances overnight. And so you can have all those things I've seen people get addicted, wealthy people, personally, and lose every bit of their money. And so there's a lot of different ways people can lose money. And I found that the people that have money in the best of times doesn't make them any happier whatsoever. Maybe it's water. Maybe yours is not money. Maybe if you look at the world today, I mean, if you've got a roof over your head, you know where the next bit of food's coming. You know that you're blessed today because the majority of the world doesn't have that. Some people in what we call fourth world countries, some people don't have water to grow food. They can barely get water for themselves. They're just barely hanging on. Maybe they think it was water like the Samaritan woman. You remember that story in John chapter four and verse seven through 15? She came to the well at that particular time of day, knowing others wouldn't be there. This Samaritan woman, this one that didn't belong, Jew or Gentile, they both hated her. And here comes Jesus to wait. And there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink, for his disciples were gone away into the city to buy me. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have have given the living water. He goes on to say, whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, speaking of the physical water from the well, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give unto him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give unto him will be a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Powerful. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. She still missed it at first. But a woman that came to the well every day for water, and Jesus offered her living water, and she took it. John 4, 28, the woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. You know what Matthew chapter 4 and verse four says, it says this, that man shall live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. How do we live? By every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Why do you get excited about that, preacher? Because we look for wisdom from TED Talks. We look for wisdom from the internet. We look for wisdom from Google. We look for wisdom from all those things. We look for happiness in all these different things. <clears throat> but God said we'd find what we were looking for when we lived by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. 
How do you, how do you get that preacher? Because the word is food for us, for our soul, for our spirit, for our mind, for our very persona. The word of God will get you through when nothing here on the face of earth will be able to get you through something. God's word will get you through it by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Job 23, 12 said, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. More than that my necessary food. Maybe it's a house and property. Paulette and I don't have a home. Do we want a home? Yes. <clears throat> but that's not what we're striving for most on the face of this earth. We're striving to serve God with everything that we have and to feed people with the word of God like we're doing right now. Why? Because we want people to be able to get through anything on the face of this earth and for eternity to be able to be blessed by Jesus Christ. What we need most is Jesus Christ, the one that's satisfied. John said this, speaking of house and property in John chapter 14 and verse two, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself that where I am there, ye may be also. Wow. I don't have to think about me so much. We just have to focus on serving God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. That was God's promise to you and I. He brings peace, the Bible tells us in Ephesians 2, and he brings rest in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. He says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. The world won't give you rest. <laughs> I've laughed most of my adult life. I watch people, oh, I got to have a holiday, a vacation. I've, I've got to get away. And they come back worn out. Behind schedule on everything. And I go, I thought you needed time off. And get this one, he brings joy, eternal. You know, something that abides forever. He said in Luke chapter two and verse 10 through 11, and the angel said unto them, fear not for I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior, a savior, a savior, which is Christ the Lord in short, he brings abundant life, satisfaction. And secondly, this morning, I, I don't think that we see Christmas right because Jesus is so much better than what we deserve. A lot of people get disappointed at Christmas. You may get disappointed. I'm not condemning you. What I'm trying to do is point you back in the right direction and say, what God gave us is so much better than what we deserve. Christmas time in my home of origin was not a happy time. Maybe it was in yours. But with Jesus, I know that we get so much more than what we deserve. 2 Timothy 2.13, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. If there was anyone that didn't deserve it, it was Peter, wasn't it? You ever think of that? You look through the Bible and go, hey, this guy didn't deserve it, right? I mean, he denied Jesus three times and then cursed him. And after the resurrection, Jesus made sure that he was invited to a uh, that Peter was invited to a gathering in Mark 16, 7, but go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee and there shall you seek him as he said unto you. And he appeared unto his disciples two times and Peter still walked away in John 21, 3, Simon and Peter said unto him, I go a fishing. They said unto him, 
we also go with you. And they went and entered into a ship immediately, and that night caught nothing. And Jesus went where Peter was at, cooked a breakfast of fish on the shore, and then lovingly, lovingly brought Peter back into fellowship. Hey, if anyone didn't deserve Jesus, it's you and me. We fail so many times, so many different ways. We make commitments that we don't keep. We have bad attitudes, and he's always waiting to forgive us. Are you seeing Christmas? And number three, because Jesus alone could bring eternal life. Eternal life. John 10, 27 through 28. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You know, to those that you may believe in the loss of salvation, I can just tell you that if it was up to us, we would lose it every day. And so Jesus did. He paid for it. He keeps it. And can I say to you this morning that it wouldn't be salvation. It wouldn't be eternal life if we could lose it, have to get it again, lose it. It's an eternal gift that the Lord offers to all of us. He's paid the whole price for every one of us, past, present, future, and about your life, past, present, future. And he offers it to us as a free gift for eternity. No wonder the wise men brought their best gifts to Jesus because he deserves it. This Christmas, I want to ask you, what are you willing to give to Jesus to get back on track and look at Christmas the right way? Would you look at Christmas as what you can give Jesus because of what he gave you? Lord bless you. Have a merry Christ-filled Christmas.